thank you for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, congratulations to Oded, David, um, and team um, on sincerely what I thought was a really good paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's so many things that um, I could talk about uh, and, you know, conscious of time, just to credentialize myself a little bit here from outside of New York City. I spent the last 20 years with two companies, um, IBM and Salesforce, um, arguably, you know, um, institutions of the American technology industry, the two organizations that going out on a limb, um, deeply appreciate the power of marketing. Uh, I, uh, at Salesforce, have a couple of different roles, but primarily lead a team called Ignite. Um, and Ignite is responsible for customer innovation uh, worldwide for Salesforce. And uh, I've had the pleasure of leading customer transformation projects, workshops in 38 countries um, over the last 15, 20 years. So um, a big believer in thought leadership. Um, we as a team call ourselves thought doers. Uh, we like to think, think big, but also roll up our sleeves, experiment, act, um, and uh, and learn a lot from that. So um, I'd be remiss without talking a little bit about Salesforce. Obviously, I'm paid as a senior executive to uh, try to impress you with how amazing Salesforce is. Um, but I genuinely believe that it's a special company. 21 years ago, it was founded uh, out of a small apartment in San Francisco. And uh, last year, we replaced ExxonMobil and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, pretty amazing. Lots of organizations talk about values of plaques, mission statements, but we are a company that really tries to live its values. Mark Benioff, our founder, co-founder, and CEO, um, has said values create value. Uh, and I've worked for two organizations, worked with many, many organizations around the world. Um, it is a rare place that shows up consistently. Not perfect. Um, but consistently in terms of its values. Um, and our number one value has always been trust. Um, from week one, you know, to this point, um, without trust, there's nothing. Uh, whether it's our infrastructure, the transparency of how we're operating our data centers, you know, to the radioactive, important, critical, confidential customer data uh, and client data um, that we have the permission to steward. Uh, we're a pioneer of cloud computing. Um, and the model is simple that our second value is customer success. We make our customers, our clients successful. At Salesforce, we call our clients customers. Um, if we make them successful, then we'll grow with them as well. I think innovation, um, you know, is really, really important. It's our third value. Uh, this is one from the beginning that we focused a lot on. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so much that we could talk about with this, but I think the one thing that I'll say is, Kind of revolutionizing software development. Um, forever, the orthodoxy around software development was um, it's all about time, functionality, and treasure, money. I mean, usually time is what you know loses out in that triad. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, no, we'll get it done. Just give us two more weeks. In the previous session about agile, um, a big change that we made was to get to seasons. Every four months, uh, we get into a cadence and rhythm of publishing you know, the next uh, version of software and making software change management easy. Um, if it's not ready, no big deal. It's at the top of the list for the next release. Uh, we had a breakthrough of 5 to 10x um, in terms of published functionality. Um, and that's just one example of innovation and equality. Um, when I went to business school, you know, learned a lot about Milton Friedman uh, and uh, rest in peace, uh, the Friedman Doctrine, right, the purpose of business is to return, you know, to uh, provide returns to shareholders. Um, we're a big believer that, you know, business needs to do much more than that. Um, and we feel like we're a pioneer um, and a great example of stakeholder capitalism, that the purpose of business is to take the interest of all stakeholders in mind um, and provide some material significant benefit to all stakeholders. And when we talk about stakeholders, uh, we include the environment, ecology, and part of this is holding deeply a value of equality. Uh, we've threatened to walk out of places like state of Indiana, state of Georgia, when we felt that they were contemplating legislation that would uh, discriminate against our employees, our clients, our ecosystem, even if it meant, you know, loss of business. Frankly, we didn't care. Uh, we feel it's really a responsibility of business to wield its power 
um, you, you know, to uh, make the play, make the world a more equal place. So we're very much a values driven company. Um, as a business from the beginning, and the portfolio has changed originally B2B, now B2B and B2C. And you're looking at a slide, hopefully, that you can see that's a real world example of Echo, uh, Danish, Denmark based shoe manufacturer um, and retailer. But from the beginning, Salesforce has been all about helping organizations deeply listen to their customers um, and then take action. I can't tell you over the almost 20 years um, of being a consultant, a practitioner, you know, an executive in different roles, meeting with so many companies, Fortune 500 companies, and leaders who talk a big game about knowing their customer. Um, and you'd scratch beneath the surface a little bit, and the reality was, and still is, they really don't know that much about their customers. Maybe to the extent of classic kind of market mar market demographic data, um, but like actionable data and insights and really understanding the customer, um, you know, very, very rare. So reading Oded's and David's paper to try to get down into the plumbing, the infrastructure, um, and what organizations can do to really um, get much smarter um, than they believe that they are about knowing their customers. Um, really applaud the great work um, that they did. And, uh, you know, when you look at Salesforce, you know, what is the basic premise of what we do? Try to bring clarity and help every organization get to the single version of truth of individual consumers and customers um, in, in a way and a level that they can today. Uh, so a couple of things that have been observations for me. I used to work for IBM. Um, a survey, I think it was 2017, that had a great nugget, um, which they revealed two out of three CEOs admitted that they make significant decisions with insufficient information. Um, this is clearly not a Salesforce corporate slide. This is my own um, with the uh, laughing out loud emoji. Uh, my reaction when I saw that was, yeah, right. And the third one is lying through his or her teeth. Um, these leaders are making huge decisions every day. Um, absent, you know, the information that they would like to have. Um, and now you look at where in the middle of COVID and all this craziness, I think it's taken that insecurity um, and the speed of significant decisions to a whole nother level. So the power of data, um, I'm a big believer in it. Um, spending 12 years at IBM, a place that was really, really successful, um, but it promoted a lot of leaders, understandably so, who were good at identifying performance gaps and closing them. And they built a lot of muscle memory around intuition. And I think I know hmm, what needs to happen. And, uh, um, you know, the, the change of data being injected into all forms of different decision-making processes, and I put their neutralizing on the right, to neutralize those emotions um, and get those leaders who maybe didn't have a shared agenda to say, hmm, that's what the data is telling us. Um, and I understand where the data is coming from. Now let's put our time and energy into what are we going to do about this? Um, so that was game changing to me to see a very big, you know, large global organization of 400,000 plus employees um, and the power of data to neutralize some of those emotions and get people to be focused on action um, and learning. Number two, and this is a general comment, um, obviously much broader than the paper. I really hate it when I hear people talking about data is the new oil. It's like, come on, stop. Um, uh, it's not a commodity. It implies that we can exploit it. We can extract it. Uh, we can add value on top of the molecules. We live in a world where trust is really, really important. Um, and uh, um, you can't take data. You can't buy data. You can't steal data. Eventually, your consumers and your market is going to catch up. It's all about earning the right. Um, to get, you know, to have your customers share the data with you. And it goes back to why I talked about trust as the number one value of, of Salesforce. The next one, FODM, future of decision making. Pre-COVID, you know, you can see this on the left. I think this insecurity of senior leaders um, making these big decisions um, and worrying about regretting them. And then we get into COVID and whatever strategic plan that these organizations had, they literally burned through them in a matter of days and weeks. Um, and how do you lead right now when you're shrouded by fog? Um, and the traditional ways that you were getting inputs and the people that you relied on, um, you know, to be your trusted advisor, 
um, have no idea what's coming um, and the importance of agility. Uh, and uh, so I think that we're still very much as an industry and an academic ecosystem in the early days of understanding the future of decision making. And I would encourage all of you to go off and study that. Uh, and uh, I think one of the hypotheses, and I've had the chance to work with Linda Hill from Harvard Business School, and years ago, this is not my thoughts, but she talks about shoulds and coulds. Um, what should an organization be good at? Um, and uh, identifying kind of the KPIs and the performance outcomes that really matter. Um, and that's important, but you could argue it's hygienic. And over time, I think the business world in corporate America, at least, has promoted um, leaders who are really good at identifying those performance gaps, the shoulds of the organization, and closing them as quickly and efficiently as possible. But I think the future of organizations and the future decision makers are the ones who are really good at the coulds. What could the organization be doing? And identifying opportunity gaps. Um, and these are in adjacent spaces. This is deeply listening to customers, pulling the organization or ecosystem into places where maybe there isn't a product or service that exists today. So I'm starting to see early days, and it's very embryonic, arise at a level of decision making and significant PLs. Um, leaders in, in parts of organizations who are focused on the coulds. And for me, one of the interesting first examples was Netflix um, and Reedy Hastings basically reconstituting, you know, an internal governance committee, which was all, all focused about operational issues and looking in the rearview mirror. Um, and, uh, and instead constituting a new, you know, strategic governance group um, that I think he called kind of the um, anti-Netflix committee. And it was all about the future and where Netflix should be. And that was a really, I think, important moment to send a signal to everyone in his leadership team to say, hey, you want to have a seat at the table and a voice around the future of Netflix? Then be thinking about the coulds, um, not necessarily the shoulds. Um, and I think every organization should be thinking like that. So we're a team. I lead a global team of innovators and strategists. Um, just looking at the clock here. Um, and we've been doing this for about eight years. Um, up until today. And as we're project-based, a couple of years ago, we realized that we were losing a lot of knowledge and value as we would finish a project and then get into the next project. And so I decided to carve out a team and have them focus on identifying some patterns, doing some sense-making, as I heard one of the pre presenters talk about before, and really look kind of broadly in both primary and secondary research. Start with the more than 150,000 customers you know, on our platform, the thousands of meetings that were happening physically and now virtually um, in executive briefings around the world, research with CEOs and CXOs directly, and to look back at the more than 400 projects that my team had done at various levels over the years. And we started with, you know, a blank sheet of paper and what are the challenges that our customers, especially at the CXO level, are coming back to us every single day? And I didn't curate this because this is a data conversation, but you can read these. The four of the six that are on here are all about data. We can't keep up with pace. What's important to customers? What really matters? We have, we're data rich, but we're insight poor. We've got data all over the place. It's stuck in different places, but it's not in the right places to make real time decisions. Uh, we've got a ton of data, but it's not really informing our strategy uh, and where we want to go as an organization. And once we know what we think we know what we want to do, and we make a, made a big decision, the changes we need to make are in conflict with the orthodoxy, the set of models, our culture, and we just maybe don't have the talent at all levels, the internal capabilities to drive this forward. So even before this paper was written, and of course, yeah, you could say we're Salesforce, right? We're in technology, we're in software. Is it slightly biased? Well, yeah, of course. But, you know, this is what's on the minds of CXOs and CEOs. And then we stepped back and said, what is the ultimate question that we're being asked? And it was kind of not a remarkable question. How do we digitally transform? And frankly, over the years, it's, I hate the words digital transformation um, as a leader. And it's like, woohoo, I wave my magic wand. You're all now digitally transformed. Who cares if you're not relevant to your customers? Um, so behind that was, I think, really a question of how do we become customer centric in a digital age? There were two big insights. And that's, I think, at the, at the core of the, the commentary that 
me and my team wrote. First were different mindsets and different mindsets that were predominant in the leadership team. First, a renovate mindset um, where think of buying CRM to just help sell the stuff that they already have on the truck. Um, and what we're going through in terms of all of these new um, digital tools being just an extension of what's been happening over the last 25 years um, and continuing with incremental thinking. I think these are the organizations that in COVID have been exposed um, and underinvested massively in the power of technology as an enabler for agility and customer centricity and deep listening. But the other side is a mindset that's really kind of dominated by entrepreneurs, startups, and what we call the transcend mindset. How do we rapidly shape shift, morph our value proposition, and constantly look at creating customer value in new ways? As I would work, work with a lot of CXOs in Fortune 500, you know, they would get frustrated because they used, a, you know, an Uber, you know, they're watching Netflix and they're like, why can't we as a bank or a manufacturing company, you know, be transcendent and think and act like these organizations? And it's like, yeah, I mean, obviously it's not that easy, but they would be really, really frustrated. And we felt that there were a lot of white papers that were out there, big brain firms, BCG, McKinsey, et cetera, who just kind of missed you know, a third mindset. And maybe it was because we were more practitioners and just coming at it from Salesforce, but I had this learning at IBM that we don't live in a world with idea problems. We live in a world with execution problems. It's easier, not easy, to come up with new business models and new offerings, et cetera. It's much, much harder to go from whiteboard to reality, right? Change the organization. Um, redesign business processes that have been honed um, and kind of embedded and reinforced in the culture for sometimes decades. Technology that reinforces that. So this third mindset is what we call evolve. And look at this as a bridge from kind of renovate, especially for large organizations to transcend. And at its core, and I'm going through this very, very quickly in my New York speed, is you know how do you put the customer at the center of your business? Um, it sounds kind of easy. And then you say, all right, well, what do we learn from all of these different organizations? that we feel are outperforming you know, their peers in industries, um, the disciplines, and you can read more of this in the commentary. But we kind of found four disciplines, kind of capabilities, but look at these as muscles that needed to be built, need to be built for any organization. First are customer-centric business processes. Jobs to be done are the outcomes that matter. Build that as an outside-in you know, mentality in business. Um, second is one team aligned around the customer. Lots of one GE, one IBM, but in the way that they actually act to deliver upon those jobs to be done is often a very, very different picture. Third is the leanest possible technology stack. We see a lot of organizations with what we call tech debt, a proliferation of investments in IT apps, marketing tools, where basically 70 to 80% of the IT budget um, is focused on governance and keeping the lights on. Um, it, you know, you can do the math, 20 to 30 percent is then focused on, you know, innovation um, and future investments. You know, leading organizations have flipped that pyramid, 70 to 80 percent focused on architectural governance and innovation, and 20 to 30 percent focused on, you know, keeping the lights on. Now, the good news, bad news is, you know, if you get to be somewhat world class in these first three capabilities, and it was great to hear kind of, you know, the findings and research from the previous group. You know, depending on the, the level of competitiveness in your industry, maybe you'll be okay for a few months, maybe a year. But you also need to be really good at sense and respond. And at a high level, this is not sit back, react, see what happens, and then move quickly. This is really about anticipation and realizing that most large organizations over the years have become optimized around efficiency. Um, and what they need to be is optimized around learning, experimentation, morphing their value proposition, and many of the things that you, know, you all talked about. So in closing, I'll say what I loved about Odeb and David and team's work was the expansive role of marketing. Great, great examples. Um, I think especially around machine learning and deep learning. I remember somebody at IBM saying marketing has moved from Madison Avenue to Wall Street and kind of not just being about four Ps, but the analytical left brain side. And we're all seeing it. I would say the evolution of that is marketing needs to go from Wall Street to Main Street 
and be ambidextrous. Be the headlights to the organization and embrace design thinking and use data to fuel that, but also be very strong in the analytical use of the tools. Some of the feedback, I think I like, you know, the expansive definition of marketing um, and that growth should be fueled by marketing. Um, But if you agree with me that the next wave of business will be stakeholder capitalism, I think it's the role of marketing to fuel growth beyond just the customer, um, but all of those stakeholders. Um, Retention is a word that I've never really liked. Salesforce, we don't have HR, we have employee success. Retention seems like you're cap- captivating or capturing someone. Um, I think that that's kind of a fleeting thought um, and look at it as a relationship that you want to build over time, which I think is the essence of what you're saying around lifetime value. Um, and I think ultimately marketing needs to be the headlights to the organization and more than just four Ps, but informed strategy. So congrats to the team and great work. Thank you, Jason. Wonderful, uh, wonderful talk, and and I, I hope we can continue to keep marketing as the headlights of the organization. That's where we belong. And your talk, all these talks have been helpful in in grappling with some of the issues uh, that marketers are facing. So let me thank all of the speakers for taking the time, especially the two that are are up there at mid, in midnight or at midnight over in the UK. So really appreciate that and your involvement in the special issue. I just have. Two final slides here as we close, Uh, and this is just to show you all of the papers in case you haven't seen them in the special issue. The the papers are listed here and and on this slide, and there are, of course, 15 commentaries uh, from marketing leaders such as Jason and Nick, um, as well as there's um, uh, somebody from the Competitions and Markets Authority, a public policy maker from the UK, who's commenting on one of the digital um, advertising papers. So please feel free to, and we encourage you to read these papers. They have wonderful research agendas, um, and they really do trap a lot of important marketing questions and offer advice to the field about how to move forward. Um, so let me close there. Um, if the speakers want to stay on for just a second, we'll get a quick photo, and let me thank all of the participants for attending. Thank you very much.